from the mast and gloved studios of Rodale Institute Radio and Television at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, it is time for another Get Outside and Grow Something episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks. You bet your garden. I'm your host, Mike McGrath. In this time of social upheaval and toilet paper shortages, more and more people want to start or expand their gardens. If only we could grow our own papyrus. Anyway, on today's show, we'll continue to educate all of you on proper technique and reinforce warnings about tilling and horse manure. Plus your fabulous phone call questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and hilariously astute histonifications. So keep your eyes and or ears, true believers, because it's all coming up faster than you eating bodacious Brussels sprouts right after this. In life, we have many kinds of partners, school bus partners, business partners, even gardening partners. Shouldn't you have one for the most important aspect of life, your health? Lehigh Valley Health Network, your health deserves a partner. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by Rodale Institute. Join the Rodale Institute online for Tea Time in Your Garden an online workshop on Wednesday, May 20th, wherein you will learn how compost tea can fertilize all your plants. Details and registration at rodaleinstitute.org. Rodale Institute, because the future is organic. All right, welcome to another all new episode of You Bet Your Garden from the studios of Rodale Institute Radio and Television at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, we will continue our recent trend of advice for new gardeners and gardeners without a lot of experience. We want to help you all grow lots of food this summer. But mostly it's going to be a fascinating phone call show, kids, at 833-727-9588. Sean, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you for being had, Sean. How are you doing? I'm doing as well as one can do in, uh, in this quarantine time. Yeah, it's, it's spooky out there. Um, <laughs> and, oh, and where are you quarantined? I am in Portland, Oregon. All right, what can we do you for, Sean? Uh, so, well, the reason for my call is that I believe I have uh, verticillium fungus in a section of my raised beds. Okay. Um, <clears throat> had several things planted in the area that just didn't really do too well. Um, you know, I'm kind of an amateur, but just from the symptoms of the plants that I was seeing, they started to wilt from the bottom, right. um, and they all eventually ended up dying. Mm -hmm. um, I did plant some things that I read were resistant to verticillium, like carrots, um, right. which, which did seem to do well. And I guess my question is, is it possible to dig out or remove the soil um, that I believe is infected and replace it with, like, new... Uh, raised bed soil, uh, or will the bacteria or the fungus persist in the soil? Tell me what your raised beds are filled with. Uh, well, I moved into this house a couple of years ago, and some of the beds are just, they just had soil in them already. Right. Um, so those ones, you know, I'm not entirely sure what the makeup is, except for that I add uh, a layer of compost to the top and just lightly fork it in each right. year. So. That's what I know is in there. Um, otherwise, I'm not entirely sure of the soil makeup. Okay. Have you been growing tomatoes in the beds? I didn't grow tomatoes, but I grew another nightshade. I grew uh, eggplant in there. And what happened to the eggplant? Uh, it just didn't really grow too well in that area. 
the bottom leaves uh, started to yellow mm-hmm. pretty badly, and then I noticed the yellowing kind of just working its way right. up the plant, um, and then, yeah, it just kind of died off sort of slowly. And how long have you been growing in these beds? This is going to be my third year. And how much sun do these beds get? I'd say currently probably like five to six hours. Okay, so, you know, that's not in a cool climate. That's a little bit light for mm-hmm. a fruiting plant like, uh, like the eggplant you mentioned. How about you continue to grow the plants that have traditionally grown well for you? and get yourself a nice container and fresh potting soil and compost, mix it half and half, pick up some really nice looking eggplant starts because it's too late in the season to start from seed, and try growing eggplant in containers. Huge advantages here because you know the plants are not that large. Mm -hmm. So I would say even a 12 inch pot would be totally acceptable and get a couple of different varieties. Do you like the classic black eggplant or do you like the Asian neon colored varieties? Uh, Either is is really fine, yeah. Well, I would grow a variety, maybe three or four different types and see what happens because those pots will be verticillium free. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think maybe the issue is to give them a little more sunlight I mean, six to eight hours a day is what really what we're talking about. And maybe some more heat. Are you familiar with floating row covers? Uh, yeah, yeah. I could give that a shot. Yeah, if you just got, you know, a floating row cover and, uh, you know, pick the sunny spot on your property. It could be on a driveway. It could be on a lawn. And line these pots up next to each other and cover them with uh, a light lightweight reme um you know uh reme is the big brand name for floating row covers and Mm -hmm. floating row covers come in either lightweight or heavyweight i would pick the lightweight and then during the day that's going to concentrate the heat around the um the whatchamacallit the eggplant uh because they they do love high heat man they do love it and it'll keep any flea beetles off them And that'll be diagnostic. If the rest of your garden does well according to your climate, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just keep track of where you plant your tomatoes and make sure you rotate them every two to three years. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, what you said is correct. The only way to get it out of your soil is to empty your beds and refill them completely, which doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. I could do that. Uh, thank you. All right. My pleasure. Thank you. You take care and be safe out there. Number to call, 833-727-9588. Dale, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you, Mike. Oh, thank you, Dale. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty well. Pretty well. I've learned much from you, Mike. Oh, okay. Uh, well, thank you. Where are you, sir? I'm in Eugene, Oregon. Okay. What can we do for you, sir? Uh, I have a landscape garden, Mike. Uh, I've been at this for quite a while. Um, And basically, I would call it my backbone plant in this garden is a Mahonia repens. This is a shrub, an evergreen shrub. It gets to about three feet tall. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's shade tolerant, and it allows me to... Uh, create little uh, backgrounds uh, in my garden. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I have more than 20 of these plants. Right. And and, um, (laughs) beginning this winter, uh, I began to notice a fungus infection in a few of them. Um, And then as spring has come along, Uh, 80% of these plants now have a serious fungus infection. Talk Um, to me about the symptoms. All right. Uh, Well, we get uh, discoloration on the leaves, a kind of a little bit of a hint of reddish darkness. Right. Then it progresses to uh, what I would call black spot. Okay. 
And then uh, now what I did was when I saw this happening, I stripped all of those infected leaves off of the plant. Okay. And now the new growth is coming in, and it is affected Mm -hmm. on most of the plants, and it's a kind of a crinkled leaf, uh, occasional little blackness on Mm -hmm. a stem, and um, uh, I would say uh, uh, thwarted growth. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just kind of amazing how... Um, it, it, 95% of it is all in this one species. The symptoms you describe uh, could be a disease. Now, but I imagine you've researched this uh, to learn the big problems with the Mahonia. Well, um, the, the one, uh, I did research fungal disease. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, the closest thing I found was something with a huge name called something like Solyndra cladium. Okay. I used to go I, out with her sister, yeah. <laughs> Cynthia cladium, but, yeah. But, um... You know what I want... Well, I'm going to make some suggestions. What I want you to do uh-huh. is go to the website of the Colorado Extension, uh-huh. Washington State Extension, any place that has the kind of conditions that you live in, and Uh look up the plant. Do not try to diagnose it yourself. See what Uh the plant is susceptible to. I have researched this plant in the past, but it's years and years ago. Uh I think what you got is a form of leaf spot, um, overcrowding, lack of airflow. It's possible that these need, but I don't know, can they take a rejuvenation pruning? Can they be cut? cut back by a third and still prosper. Yes. Well, I would increase the airflow. I would double down on the compost. I would check that soil, even though it's a raised bed, um, make sure it's still not saturated, as you have a lot of high water tables in your area, too. Yes. Um, And then keep doing the Cornell spray. I like the Cornell spray. That's baking soda and oil right uh yeah oil and a um, little bit of soap uh, correct yeah okay that's an that's- excellent that's an excellent one i would also if that's working maybe try a sulfur no um sulfur uh, copper copper thank you ah it's just <laughs> a, it's just a different element <laughs> yeah i would try a copper spray or maybe even a Bordeaux mix, which is... Bordeaux. Yeah, Bordeaux like in, in France. Yeah. Um, Bordeaux mix is copper and, um, oh, and lime. <clears throat> it goes back untold centuries as a disease fighter. I see. Okay, great. Well, I will, uh, I will uh, increase my use of that. Yeah, I think you solved your own problem, man. Thank you very much. All right, good luck to you, sir. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Number to call. Write it in chalk outside when you thank all the people bringing you your packages and your grocery and your newspaper. 833-727-9588. Jessica, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jess. How are you doing? I'm doing just ducky. How are you, Mike? Oh, double ducky. <laughs> And we've got Ducky in the studio, and he has a brand new mask on so you can see his eyes and, um, you know, social distancing from the robot. We're doing good here. Where, where is Jessica? I'm in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Mushroom soil capital of the world. All right, what can we do for Jessica in Kennett Square, which I, I should mention is also the home of the fabled Longwood Gardens? My question today, Mike, is about birdseed. Yes. I've heard you talk a lot about birdseed in the past and um, different things that are good for our birds, which is definitely what I'm interested in. So my question is about um, their castings or or their shells that Mm -hmm. um, are left behind. That's an Um, excellent question. 
because there's a very interesting answer that very few people are aware of. Uh, the higher quality bird seed, as you know, is the big black oil sunflower seeds. Right. Well, it turns out that the seeds in the shells are allopathic. They actually stunt the growth of many other plants, just like the roots of black walnut trees do to tomatoes and many other plants. So the spillings underneath a bird feeder not only attract mice, rats, and voles, um, they put plant-damaging, naturally occurring chemicals into the soil. Is it important for me to get rid of them? Yes, yes. But okay. even more important, I would suggest you follow kind of the new rules of birding, which people okay. don't want to do, but I think it's more important to do what's necessary for the birds than it. for some false sense of amusement. And it is crit your timing is so perfect. Thank you. Because we're now entering the period where birds are nesting, and pretty soon their young will be hatching out. Uh, the Humane Society, many other groups are begging people at least not to feed seed during this crucial period because the baby birds don't develop the necessary habits, uh, native intelligence of finding uh, wild food in the woods or all around. And obviously there's plenty of that food around or we wouldn't have all these birds to begin with. They have no problem finding fresh food in the summer, but fresh water can become scarce. So having a bird bath or eight and keeping their water nice and fresh and clean is something that'll make the birds happier and healthier than artificial food. Then when we get to the cold weather, now's the time not to feed them with seed, but to feed them with suet cakes. Hang suet cakes all over your property. You will see more birds than you thought possible. Uh, chickadees, the nut thatch, six or eight different kinds of woodpeckers, house wrens. Um, in the wintertime, the birds that stay, that don't migrate, they need good resources of protein and fat to get through the winter. And suet provides that. And, you know, a lot of fancy cakes of suet, they have like berries and nuts and stuff pressed into them. That's fine. But that really keeps the birds that you want around because they're all meat-eating birds. Chickadees eat two to three times their own weight in insect huh. pests every right. day. They, they have to because you can see how much energy they're burning and they have small bodies. Sure. So you feed them suet over the winter and then as soon as the weather warms up, you take the suet feeders down. The birds are not going to leave. They've already taken up residence. They've already picked where they're going to put their nest. They've registered the kids in the local school district. They're going to just switch over from suet to eating your pest insects, including some of the worst, which are these insects that bore into trees and slowly destroy them. That's what mm -hmm. woodpeckers and chickadees are specialists at. I love this idea. I'm going to work on these bird baths. I'm going to have plenty of things to, for them to eat in, in suet form and try to get some woodpeckers and chickadees to the backyard. Very good. Very good. All right. Good luck well, to you. Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye-bye. All right. As promised, here it comes, the question of the week. More advice for gardeners in training. Harry in New Brunswick writes, my girlfriend and I are young gardeners in our third season, expanding every year. We listen avidly to your show, do research, and ask family members who are longtime gardeners for advice. Now, some of our family's tactics are old school and do not align with some of yours, like tilling the soil and using manure. Now, we have two main questions. Numero uno. We did not have time last fall to do any mulch leaf compost, 
as winter came early and we were on the road a lot. We're musicians, and this year we won't be touring due to COVID-19. So we're wondering how to prepare our beds for this season. The soil has received two seasons worth of horse manure compost mixed with our native soil. Could you suggest ideas on how to prepare these beds? As our family has suggested to add nothing and till them, but I am reluctant. The beds are raised, but they are simply rounded, no frames, sort of like the French intensive method that you've spoken about on the show. Our aunt suggested this method when we first started. Okay, well this question raised a lot more questions with me, so I asked how big the beds were and what they expected to grow. The answer, the beds are four by six and four by eight and around eight to 12 inches tall. There would be peppers, tomatoes, onions, lettuce, beets, peas, beans, herbs, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, zucchini, and carrots. We've also started a new bed this spring for corn and potatoes. Okay, the first thing you have to realize is that these are vastly different crops timing-wise. Lettuce and peas will only do well in the spring. Now, lettuce will do just as well, maybe even better in the fall. But timing a fall crop of peas is beyond tricky, even for experienced gardeners. Broccoli and Brussels sprouts are also cool weather crops. But you can cut the main head off of your broccoli when it starts to get hot, and the plant will produce tasty side shoots in the fall. That's a great trick that I don't talk about often enough. Now, Brussels sprouts, I'm sorry, they're like escargot, proof that anything can taste good if you saturate it with enough butter and garlic. It's also a cool weather crop, but a weird one. It'll grow nicely in the spring and in the summer, but if harvested in the summer, those spooky little heads will have an off taste. I would sarcastically ask how anybody could tell, but then I'd get all you Brussels sprout lovers mad at me. Both of you. The answer is patience. Wait until after a few frosts in the fall and the mustardy taste will resolve into a pleasant sweetness. Or so I'm told. And the plants are super frost hardy. Bend them to the ground and cover them with straw or shredded leaves when it gets really cold and you can harvest them throughout the winter. Kind of the same with carrots. Harvest them young and small in the spring before the weather gets hot. Then sow another run for fall, waiting to pick them until after cold weather concentrates their sugars. Now, carrots should not be fed strong fertilizers, even natural ones like your horse manure, and should be grown in your loosest, lightest soil, not in any place where people have been walking on it. Same for beets, loose soil, and don't harvest in hot weather. As we always stress, fruiting crops like tomatoes and peppers do not do well with horse manure alone. It's all nitrogen and will grow big plants with few fruits. Good old yard waste compost is a much better bet. But you can mix fresh horse manure with shredded leaves in the fall and make great balanced compost for the following season. Now, about horse manure. Like wood ash, it is a prime example of just because you have a lot of something doesn't make it good for your garden. It would be perfect for your sweet corn, but only if it's completely composted. And that means it looks like good soil, isn't warm to the touch, and doesn't smell like poop anymore. If it isn't fully composted, it'll grow more weeds than food. Same with tilling. Tilling destroys soil structure, releases nutrients, adds to greenhouse gases, and uncovers and then buries untold numbers of weed seeds, which will turn into real weeds, which will be devil you all season long. One of the big advantages of having a raised bed garden is that you shouldn't be stepping on the soil. So there's no need to till. Just add two inches of compost a year to the surface. Do not till it in. And don't waste a raised bed on sweet corn. 
Sweet corn has a tendency to fall over in loose soil. It is the perfect crop for flat earth. And try growing your potatoes in an above ground box or bin. More raised bedroom for your tomatoes. Question number two. No, we're not done yet. We are planning to use our pond this summer to water our garden. It has koi fish and frogs in it. We were wondering if we should have the water tested first or just make sure we wash our veggies well. Well, pond water contains fish poop and silt, which are exceptional additions to a vegetable garden, better even than rainwater. And you always want to wash your produce no matter who grew it or how. Well, that sure was some interesting advice on how to avoid abject failure this season, now wasn't it? Luckily for you, you can read that information over at your leisure or your leisure because the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website. Just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden question of the week, and you will always find the latest question of the week at the Gardens Alive website. You Bet Your Garden is a half-hour public television show, an hour-long public radio show and podcast, all produced and delivered to you weekly by Rodale Institute Radio and Television at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created by the comedy team of Burns and Schreiber. Yikes, my producer is threatening to force feed me Brussels sprouts if I don't get out of this studio. Man, we really must be out of time. But you can call us anytime at 833-727-9588 or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teaming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Please include your location. You'll find all of our contact information, plus answers to your garden questions, audio of this show, video of this show, audio and video of old shows, aye, and links to our internationally renowned podcast. Don't miss that, kids. It's all at our website, youbetyourgarden.org. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, saying keep your distance, tend your garden, register to vote, eat lots of peaches, grow lots of tomatoes, and I'll see you again next week.